So I'd like to begin our conversation tonight by welcoming you on behalf of the Center for the Study of World Religions. My name is Frank Clooney. I'm the director of the center and member of the faculty here. And I know many of you are familiar faces who've been here many times, so welcome back. And if this happens to be your first time here, it's great to have you with us. Um, as you may know from previous gatherings, if you've been here, these are meant to be collegial, conversational, um, enjoyable times together, probing into the wonderful work that our professors do. Part of that is to eat, drink, and be merry. So if you are inclined, uh, as we're talking, to get up and get something more to eat or drink, uh, don't be shy, as long as you don't block the camera for too long. That will be the only requirement. Um, we also, the general pattern for these sessions will be, I'll begin by introducing uh, tonight's author, Janet Yatso. Uh, she will have a chance to speak first, uh, to present something of her book and how she came to write it. Then our two respondents, and I'll introduce them each at the time when they speak, will talk about the book from a certain angle, their own perspective. Then uh, Janet Gietzo will have a chance to um, respond to them. And then their chairs will be presented uh, facing out toward you in the front here for an open conversation with yourselves as well. So I think it's meant to be an enjoyable season. The only really firm rule we have is we finish by 7 o'clock. Um, and then informal conversation can continue after that. But as I begin, I'd just like to make a general point that as director of the center, um, I find these book events one of the most enjoyable things uh, to happen at the center. Um, we spend a lot of time doing our research and writing. We put incredible effort into our books. And often people say, a oh, great book, great cover. Um, and then you don't get the sense whether anyone has actually looked too deeply inside it. So these occasions are a chance to not simply celebrate each other's works, but get into how we've thought about these topics, how we do the writing, and so on. So a great occasion. We've had a number of these events this year. We have one more. I just advertise it on April 28th, Marla Frederick from the Committee on the Study of Religion. Her book presentation will be on April 28th, and that'll be the last one for the year. So let me just then begin by introducing a person who needs no introduction, Janet Gyatso is the Hershey Professor of Buddhist Studies and also Associate Dean for Faculty and Academic Affairs here at the Divinity School. Uh, she has her PhD from the University of California in Berkeley. She is, as you all know, I think, a specialist in Buddhist studies with a concentration on Tibetan and South Asian cultural and intellectual history. She is also a member, in addition to the Divinity School, of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences Committee in the Study of Religion the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations, and the Committee on Inner Asian and Altaic Studies. She's also a leader and active participant in the Harvest Buddhist Studies Forum. She's involved too right here at the Divinity School in development of a new track for the training of Buddhist lay ministers and leaders in the MDiv program here at HDS, a very innovative and pioneering program. She was previously also the president of the International Association of Tibetan Studies from 2000 to 2006, and also co-chaired the Buddhism section of the AAR from 2004 to 2010. In her teaching and writing, she does work on Buddhist history, ritual, and ideas, Tibetan literary practices, and religious history. In both teaching and writing, Professor Gyatso draws on cultural and literary theory and endeavors to widen the spectrum of intellectual resources for understanding of Buddhist and Tibetan history. She's also been writing on sex and gender in Buddhist monasticism and on the current female ordination movement in Buddhism. Uh, previous topics in her scholarship have included visionary, revelation in Buddhism, lineage, memory, and authorship, the philosophy of experience, and autobiographical writing in Tibet. Her writings are, as you would expect, prolific and numerous. I'll just mention several of the books. In the Mirror of Memory, Reflections on Mindfulness and Remembrance in Indian and Tibetan Buddhism, 1992. Apparitions of the Self, The Secret Autobiograph Autobiographies of a Tibetan Visionary, 1999. Women in Tibet, Past and Present, 2006. Her current projects, in addition to the one we're discussing tonight, uh, include um, Tibetan Reception of Sanskrit Poetics, uh, 
another project on the possibility and skill in human communication with cats and other animals and how this has philosophical implications. And another project on seeing, imagining oneself from the outside as others might see you, constituting a key dimension of ethical self-cultivation. Um, tonight, when we turn to this wonderful book, Being Human in a Buddhist World, an Intellectual History of Medicine in Early Modern Tibet, the first thing to be said, and you'll notice this when, you, when I pass it around, it's a beautiful book. Um, it's lush in its images, uh, so well set up, but that is not to make us neglect the, the content, which is the intellectual high power of this volume. And I can't help concluding by reading a passage that I very much appreciate from the <coughs> introduction to the book, which raises many issues close to my own heart. And I'll do this and then turn things over to Janet. She writes, I am convinced that to read for processes, reach, reaches, retreats, experiments, questions, and worries, rather than positions, requires a humanistic eye. Quite apart from whatever issue is at stake, we are best poised to appreciate the fact that a significant process is in progress when we remember how opaque our own ideas can be. Keeping sight of our own history allows the scholars we are reading to be as human as we are, to be stretching beyond themselves, to be still in the process of thought. So if contemporary biomedicine is home to untold stories, numbers of unsettled questions, so was Tibetan medicine. We read to find other human beings taken up with the questions in ways that are meaningful to us, sometimes less to find out what answers they proposed than to appreciate their negotiation of complexities along the way. So I think it's a wonderfully scholarly project, humane project by one of our uh, most appreciated teachers and scholars. So let us welcome Janet Katzen. Thank you so much, Frank, for the introduction and also just for having these events, which I always enjoy very much. And now I'm especially appreciative of it being my turn <laughs> to have it about my book. And I also do want to make one more joke about the um, uh, don't judge a book by its cover. Uh, in, in my case, I, I, I'm fortunate to have, it's a very beautiful production and indeed a very, very beautiful cover, but sometimes I get the impression that that's, that may indeed be all that anybody ever, that's, that's as far as people get. So many people have come up to me and said, oh, your you know, book is so beautiful. I said, all right, but you know, anything else? Did, did you like look at it inside? Anyway, uh, so I, just according to the way these things go, I t thought I'll just give you, I'll just tell you a little bit about how I, why and how I took up this project and just some of the sort of the larger contours of what I'm trying to do in the book. Uh, basically, how did I come to write this or how did I come to get into it? I'll say the, the primary and most direct and important answer was it just, I just love the material. So as soon as I was exposed to it, I said, yes, this is great. I really like this. Not knowing why, but just really loving it. So going for the sweet spot for me is always the best reason to get into a project. And then later on, you, you figure out what's important about it. Um, a, a little bit more fulsome story is that basically after I finished an earlier project, I had the intention of doing a, a full project on gender and the history of women in Tibet. Uh, and uh, one of the things I thought of early on was, well, uh, I, I wonder what the medical texts say about women and the whole question of sexual identity and even gender, if there's anything there. Uh, now, it turns out in the, you know, in the kind of training that I had, which was in a Buddhist studies program, um, I, uh, and in also even in Tibetan studies itself, um, there, there is really, there, there is a huge uh, medical literature out there in, uh, from Tibetan history, but pretty much no one has studied it except for just a few very superficial looks at things. And so I was really delving into sort of uncharted territory, but one of the things that happened is, well, for one thing, I was very fortunate that at the time, I was still at Amherst College, there was, it shows you how long I've been working on this thing, uh, there happened to be a Tibetan medical uh, historian who was out in Western Mass who was teaching uh, Tibetan medicine. I was fortunate enough to be able to go out and, and start reading with, with him a few passages, and, and I was extremely struck. Uh, yeah, yes, indeed, there, uh, of course, the medical text is a whole lot about the nature of women and the nature of sexual identity. 
Uh, but I was very, very struck by the, the way that the discussion unfolded and the kind of language that was being used and just the whole approach to knowledge. You know, again, being steeped in a background in Buddhist studies, I've been reading, you know, Buddhist works, Buddhist ritual, Buddhist metaphysics, Buddhist philosophy, Buddhist epistemology, Buddhist, uh, you know, ritual. Uh, this was like a revelation to see the Tibetan language, which, you know, which is not, a, this is not a statement about Tibetan, it's, it's about our, the way that we were trained in the West in this area. Just to see the Tibetan language used in a very cultivated and, and sophisticated way, but talking about much more practical, pragmatic things on the ground was, for me, just an absolute breath of fresh air for a change. Uh, and so I said, wow, you know, you can use the Tibetan la language and write in this kind of way. So I actually found myself a little bit drifting away from the project on gender itself, although in the final book I, I do now have a chapter on gen gender that's still there. But I was much more, I, I got interested in the whole field of medicine itself and in Tibet. And in particular, trying to get at that very thing that I was sort of perceiving in maybe at first a very aesthetic way <coughs> was simply that tone, that orientation, that approach to writing and knowledge and thinking. And that, that was distinctively, I would say, not religion. Now, that, of course, is a controversial thing to say. Um, and, uh, and what do I mean by that? And, you know, as I'm sort of having that perception that that's, I'm really seeing a different sort of epistemic place or subject position, um, uh, you know, how do I define what's different about that or how do I get a handle on what that's about? And of course, it begs the very question of what is the category, what, what do we mean by religion? Why am I saying this is not re religion? Well, so just a bit of background, uh, and one of the things about this book is that uh, there is currently um, a lot of people interested in Buddhist studies in medicine, in Buddhist traditions. Um, and actually, uh, just backtracking a little bit, um, medicine and Buddhism have a long history together, starting in India, where even in the early monastic communities, it seemed that Buddhist monks were being trained in various kinds of medicinal practices as well. Um, and so there is a long intersection between Buddhism and medicine, and yet, you know, what, what I'm trying to sh say is that there's a way in which, at least in Tibetan medicine, that Buddhism and medicine in certain interesting ways diverge. However, I'm pretty much the only person who's saying that. So everybody, either if they're doing Tibetan medicine or uh, Buddhist medicine in China, there's a lot of work being done on Chinese medicine and also Japan, uh, and some work on Indian Buddhist medicine, not a lot. Uh, everyone is saying, you know what, the, our whole Western categories of religion and science are not really relevant to this case. You know, you really can't distinguish them. They're, each is imbued with each other, and that kind of distinction doesn't work. Um, and I'm saying, you know, no, actually, there, there is an important distinction that you can, that there, there are ways in which that I think that it's, it's wrong to just collapse the categories of, of religion and science, even if we take them in the sort of common sense ways that we understand them in English. Uh, they're relevant, actually. What I'm finding amongst these Tibetan intellectuals is that they're wrestling with issues that are very similar and at least recognizable. So secondly, so this, this book is going against the grain of, of, of scholarship in the West on Buddhist medicine. Yet on the other hand, what I'm claiming is that the, the very issues that I'm raising were issues that were apparent to the writers that I'm talking about. And actually, in this final chapter, uh, one, we actually find that they are developing categories in which to distinguish the, 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 approach to the, the approach to knowledge and knowledge acquisition and the nature and purpose of knowledge um, that distinguishes uh, medical knowledge from the Buddhist tradition. So there's actually terms that you can point to, those of you in the room who do Sanskrit things. So the word dharma, which is a term that you might, it means like the way or a path, it might conceivably be a term for religion in the most general sense. 
um, in South Asia, uh, the Tibetans come up with a term uh, that they distinguish two types of dharma, human dharma and pure dharma. And pure dharma is clearly the teachings of the Buddha. This human dharma is, is an ambiguous category, which I think they're trying to get at some of the issues that are somewhat familiar to us from the history of the scientific revolution in the West, actually, in which issues about authority, scriptural revelation, about um, the nature of truth, um, the importance of empirical fact versus received wisdom um, become salient issues. And so I'm trying to point that out. Now, um, why is that important? Uh, that um, not only am I seeing it happening, but this is an issue for them. And so it's, it's, it, there's a difference between just seeing it happen and realizing that historically these people are recognizing that such an issue is a problem. And they don't really have the language to deal with it. They're trying to make up the language in order to deal with it. But why is that important? Um, I think it has a lot of impl implications for our general history of ideas altogether. And I'm talking now internationally, globally, in terms of our history of the world and the history of ideas. Um, the, the fact that m the medical historians were self-conscious of the fact that there's different types of knowledge that are relevant in different types of contexts. Again, it might not seem so much, but actually it has a lot of implications because what it means is that there's not one single absolute truth that's true in all cases for all con contexts. That there's different realms of knowledge. And that starts to smack of some of the ways that we understand the dawn of modernity, to use this term, um, in the West or other parts of the world as well. A knowledge that, that not, no one thing, such as the, the Buddhist dispensation, can be true everywhere and in all times. There's no absolute final truth that everything collapses down to. So that's really important to say that that's happening in places you know, outside of where we normally locate those kinds of ideas in the, in the Enlightenment in the West. Um, early on, um, I got so excited about this fact and, and other kind of parallels with uh, the scientific revolution in the West that I said, oh my God, you know, I've really now here discovered something really important about Tibetan history, um, you know, but uh, the longer I was working on this project, and I will say this project took me a very, very long time to finish. It was very complicated. The sources were very hard to understand, the, the rhetoric is very subtle, and I also want to mention that um, for eight years I had a doctoral student who was a, a, a Tibetan student from Lhasa who was working on his own doctoral dissertation here in Inner Asia and Altaic Studies, uh, but he also helped me to read uh, almost all of the primary sources that I use for this work. And, and, and without the experience of working with him and seeing the way he read the rhetoric and what's really happening behind the surface, it would have been very, very hard for me to figure out what really was going on. His name is Yanga, um, and he's back in Tibet right now. Um, but um, uh, it's, it really turned out to be quite complex. Um, uh, but I do think that, um, and I'll be interested to see if our commentators um, say anything about this or not, but um, certain grounds or certain, you know, centers of gravity that really do distinguish what we might call a scientific perspective and, and religious perspective. Some of the things that I saw happening had to do with, again, issues of absolute authority, yeah. Uh, certainly the, the power of ritual, um, uh, a, a sense of, one, one of the things I bring out in the book is about this sort of way that death figures on the horizon uh, for the medical, for medical theory and for the physicians. You know, in Buddhism, you have a sense, you know, you die, there's a notion of reincarnation, there's a whole idea of somehow transcending death in a certain way. That, that there's an ethical kind of uh, path that goes along with getting ready for death. Uh, in, in medicine, it's just very, very different. There's no sort of sense of the possibility of perfection. 
you know, medicine is convinced that, you know, we're alive, we get sick, you know, life is always imperfect, and we die, and that's the end of story. There's not a word about anything happening, not about the bardo or next life or anything like that. That's, it's just a very, very different orientation that I feel that you can discern throughout the whole thing. So that's what I tried to bring out. Um, on the other hand, uh, it was very, very interesting to see, nonetheless, that these writers on medicine in Tibet were inheriting you know, a huge tradition of philosophical analysis and, and historical writing in, from Tibetan Buddhism. And not only that, all kinds of traditions of ethical self-formation, practice, um, and, 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 and types of intellectual reflection, and, and many, many different sorts of ways of thinking, categories, are taken from Buddhist traditions and actually transformed and applied in the medical context in really interesting ways. So for, uh, just to give two quick examples, one is <coughs> uh, the, not just the notion of compassion, which obviously is, is important for physicians, but the technologies of developing compassion. So types of meditative exercises were transformed. They used the same you know, fine-grained techniques to think through the course of an illness. You know, so for, for, for example, the whole notion of the middle path in Buddhism, how not to uh, tip to one extreme or the other, not to go into nihilism or essentialism, but to stay in the middle, is then transformed in the medical context as a way for physicians to train their own ability to sort of figure, you know, what do physicians have to do? One of the most important things is figure out what's wrong, right, diagnosis. And so how do you hit the nail on the head correctly, not to go too far, not to go not far enough? They're using Buddhist language or language that's developed in Buddhist ethical um, training traditions to apply to medical knowledge. Another uh, conception is the one of extrasensory perception. So the idea of being able to see that which is not seen. In other words, for the physicians, this is about seeing what's you know, underneath the skin, what's inside the body. So they're very familiar with this idea that the Buddhas can see the past and the, and, and the future. The Buddha can see what you're thinking. The Buddha you know, has this extrasensory kind of perception. In some ways, the, the, the doctor can use that kind of you know, model or inspiration as a way of sharpening his own way of figuring out what's wrong with a patient. And you know, these discussions are developed without any of the sort of ethical or ritual kind of language around them. They're just using them as basically a, a skill in straight ahead you know, medical di diagnosis. So it's really interesting to see how those things happen. That's really religion impacting and perhaps improving scientific method. Anyway, so that's all the things, these, these things really struck me and kept me very interest, interested. Um, I especially loved uh, the, these medical paintings, which is what makes the book so beautiful. The, these, I was able to um, reproduce a, a set of gorgeous medical illustrations. And I have a whole chapter on just analyzing what's, what's going on in these illustrations. I, I, I won't say more now, but they just were so much fun to work with. They're just absolutely delightful. Uh, there's also some very, very cool stuff in the medical tradition on gender and, um, and this whole notion of pulse um, and bodily style um, and the flexibility and fluidity of that, which is really an, an interesting thing that got me excited. And then finally, um, the uh, medical ethics, how to learn from the teacher. Again, it's an area that sort of takes, you know, traditions coming out of Buddhism of the relationship between the guru and the disciple, but in medicine, it's very, very different. Um, and it has a lot to do with um, getting so close to the teacher that you pick up all of the teacher's habits. So the, actually the, the medical text says, you know, whatever your teacher likes to do, 
you should like to do that too. So if your teacher likes farming, you should get into farming. If your teacher likes playing sports, you should get into playing sports. If your teacher likes to fight and beat up people, you should do that as well. You know, so again, there's no sort of judgment. on It's, it's not about whether the teacher's a good guy or not. It's just that you know, you, you're kind of in, inhabiting his body in a certain way uh, as part of a way of, of picking up those kind of talents. So those kinds of pa passages I had a lot of fun with it. So anyway, I'll now just go sit down on the hot seat. And <laughs> Thank you, Janet. We'll have to have a special session sometime on whether Harvard professors should have their students do as they do also. <laughs> God knows where that would lead us. So thank you very much for introducing your book to us. And the, the task before our two discussants tonight is not to do book reports, not to cover comprehensively all the material in this magisterial work, but rather to open up different angles for the sake of our conversation. So I'm delighted, first of all, tonight to uh, welcome um, Malcolm David Eckel. David is Professor of Religion and Director of the Institute for Philosophy and Religion at Boston University. Uh, David received his BA from Harvard, a BA and MA from Oxford, and his PhD in the study of religion from Harvard. It's a pleasure to welcome David, but also welcome him back. Uh, you may know that David was a professor on our faculty for a number of years and in fact was the administrative director here of the center. So it's always a pleasure when David crosses the river and comes back into the space, which in partly is very much indebted to your presence for those many years here. Uh, David is a well-appreciated professor at uh, Boston University. In addition to his administrative tasks, his teaching has been well-recognized by the university. Uh, he won the Metcalf Re Award for Teaching Excellence and he has also served as a distinguished professor in the humanities. Um, so he's well appreciated, and I think you'll hear his style tonight. As a scholar, his interests include the history of Buddhist philosophy in India and Tibet, the relationship between Buddhism and other Indian religions, the expansion and adaptation of Buddhism in Asia and the West, Buddhist narrative traditions and their relationship to Buddhist ethics, and the connection between philosophical theory and religious practice. Among his many publications, I'll just mention a few of the books. Uh, Ganagarva's Commentary on the Distinction Between the Two Truths, an eighth century handbook of Madhyamaka philosophy from 1987. To See the Buddha, a philosopher's quest for the meaning of emptiness, 1992. Buddhism, origins, beliefs, practices, holy texts, and sacred places, 2002 and Bhavi Veka and his Buddhist opponents, published here at Harvard in 2008. He's also the editor of a number of volumes, including India and the West, The Problem of Understanding, published here at the Center in 1985, and Deliver Us from Evil, 2008. So I can't think of a better respondent than David Eckel, and welcome for coming. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming. It's wonderful to be back at the at center, and thanks to you, Janet, for giving us such a wonderful excuse to get together this afternoon. As I heard you talking about your beautiful book, I thought, geez, that's what it was about. <laughs> <laughs> How wonderful. Now I should just go home and rewrite my remarks. The problem is I don't have enough time to do that. So what I'm going to have to do is, is uh, read you just a few thoughts that occurred to me when I was working through Janet's marvelous book and hope that they will spark some kind of uh, interesting discussion. Whenever I stand in this room, in the common room of the Center for the Study of World Religions, I'm reminded of another event that took place a few years ago when I was asked to be Santa Claus at the Center Christmas party. Do you still have Christmas parties, Frank? No. Okay, holiday parties. I'm just kind of curious about that. Um, and so I was asked to be Santa Claus, and the last thing I wanted to do was to be a scary Santa Claus. And since I was a graduate student at that time, it was really easy to be a scary Santa Claus. I didn't want to traumatize all those little impressionable kids who were in this room, uh, and they were waiting for me 
to step through that door. My office was back there where the refrigerator is right now. So I, I thought I would speak with kind of a friendly voice, but I had no idea what that would be like. Be like. So I walked through that door, opened my mouth, and out popped the voice of an Irish Santa Claus. <laughs> I had no idea where that came from. Uh, and there it was. For that moment, I was an Irish Santa Claus right in this room. I won't tell you what I said because uh, those of you who know what a real Irish accent is like would easily see that it was coming from the wrong place. Anyway, um, I know I don't have much time, so I'll limit myself just to four points about why I think Professor Gyatso's book is extremely important for all of us who have gathered here to consider it and should be received with great reverence, not only in Tibetan studies, but to anyone who's interested in a whole range of possible subjects, many of which she has just mentioned, including Buddhism, study of religion, the study of medical traditions, and the impact of a scientific attitude toward medical practice in a country that at the time uh, in which uh, Professor Gatso uh, has been studying, um, Tibet was on the cusp of modernity. I would have preferred to make only three points just to keep my remarks simple, but I didn't know which one of these points to drop. So you can think of my remarks like the symbolic exegesis of the syllable om. Three sounds plus a fourth, except that my fourth sound will be more than silence. So my first point has to do with the study of texts and their commentaries, especially in Tibet. You know that a lot of what we do in the study of religion has to do with texts and their commentaries. This is especially true in the study of Tibet. Being human in a Buddhist world, like a lot of works in this field, is based on a root text, the so-called four treatises, the Gyu Shi composed by Yutok Yunden Gunpo in the 12th century and commented on by a string of Tibetan commentators, most notably Desi Sangye Gyatso, protege of the great fifth Dalai Lama and the founder of a medical college in Lhasa. That college, incidentally, was located across from the Potala on a hill that's known today as Chakpori. The hill is still there and has a great view of the Potala, but the medical college has been demolished and has been replaced, at least it was when I was last there, by a big Chinese telecommunications tower. That tells you something about the political realities of modern Tibet. Another key figure in the commentarial tradition is Zorkarwa Lodra Gelpo who lived a century before the Desi, and by Professor Gyatso's reckoning, is probably Tibet's most brilliant medical writer. Jonathan Z. Smith has said that any important work in the study of religion should deal with an exemplum that has been well and thoroughly understood in its own right, and also is displayed in the service of some important theory. some paradigm, or some fundamental question. One important theoretical question has to do with the relationship in this book between empirical medical science, the actual observation of the conditions of the human body, and the structures of religious authority. Coming as it did on the cusp of modernity, this had implications for the study of many other aspects of learning in Tibet and not just in Tibet, but also in the rest of Asia. It also has implications for the way we study commentaries. As you know, if you have read or tried to study traditional Tibetan commentaries, this is no easy task. Janet just referred to this, especially in an area that is as arcane and largely unknown as Tibetan medicine. In the old days, it would have been enough just to figure out one commentary, thank you, or maybe even one part of one commentary. I know what that's like. <laughs> 
But this book is based on the deep study and analysis of an entire commentarial tradition, and that's one of the reasons why it has grown gradually over such a long period of time. By putting all of these together, Professor Gatso has given us a picture of these commentators as living, breathing scholars. And this is an aspect of the book that I don't think Janet has just referred to, but these scholars, Zorkarwa and the Desi, just leap off the page as lively thinkers and human beings. It's extraordinary, actually, to sense them in this way. She has brought this tradition to life. And of course, that's exactly what's intended, because the tradition has to do with the complex problems of life and death in actual human beings. This book, I think, raises the bar for any of us who work on commentarial traditions in South Asia and hope in some way to find what it is that makes these texts come to life. It's brilliant, Janet, really. I'm, I'm, I'm sensing that I have written all these words on a page here, and I would actually rather throw the page away and just say, oh, this is why I love the book. <laughs> yes. So anyway, I'll say that again in a few minutes in case you forget. <laughs> now, my second point has to do with the relationship between reason and tradition in Buddhist thought, or reason and scripture. It's well known that Indian Buddhists had a distinctive approach to the relationship between reason and tradition. They pay great respect to the authority of the Buddha's teaching, but they also subject it to critique from the point of view of rational investigation, or in some cases, simply from experience. A formula that I run across often in my own work on Indian sources is that you should rely on reason that is consistent with or follows tradition. Well, that's fine as far as it goes, but what does it mean to follow tradition? Chapter three of Being Human the chapter on the word of the Buddha gives us a stunning picture of the complexity of this question. The question is whether the traditional ascription of these four treatises to the Buddha by Shudja Guru can be trusted, or should it be understood as being written by a historical Tibetan author, namely Yutok Yunten Gunpo. The evidence of the text seems suspicious. There are lots of details, like a small one, like the mention of tsampa in the text, staple food of Tibet, that makes the text seem Tibetan. But there are lots of hermeneutical possibilities that are available to dodge the force of the question. First of all, you talk could have been a manifestation in some way of the compassion of the Buddha, or he could have been inspired by the blessing of the Buddha. I take this to be the Tibetan word jinlap, and that's a common term in Sanskrit literature that goes way, way back for a statement that's inspired in some way by the disembodied power of the Buddha. What's intriguing about this discussion is, to me, is how ambiguous, clever, and elusive the different thinkers are in their handling of this question. They want to, in some way, have it both ways. And Janet brought this out brilliantly in the book. They want to assert and recognize the autonomy of rational investigation and empirical investigation, too. But they also want to do that in a way that, that acknowledges and is framed by this recognition of the authority of the of the Buddha. Once again, the complexity and the ambiguity bring the commentators to life. And this is one more reason why I think this is a marvelous book. <laughs> OK, the third point that I want to speak about has to do with gender. Janet has just mentioned that. Another chapter that I found particularly helpful was chapter six on women and gender. Anyone who teaches introductory courses in Buddhism, as Charlie and I did with a group of undergraduates here at Harvard back in the fall, 
Anyone who teaches one of these courses knows how problematic it is to deal with Buddhist attitudes toward women and gender. It's not enough to assume that the tradition treats everyone as equal, as much as we wish it did. So we try to find a model, perhaps even one that can be written on a blackboard, that pictures some kind of structured ambiguity, a model that acknowledges androcentrism and misogyny on one side, while it identifies the resources to criticize these inequities on the other. Chapter 6 is an extraordinary model of how to do this, and if you don't read any other chapter in the book, this wouldn't be a bad one to read. Professor Gyatso says, for its part, Tibetan medical writing produces starkly misogynistic passages on occasion, but there also are a few surprising moments when certain theorists soared above the usual consignment of the female to inferiority and even made liberative suggestions about gender. And one of the most striking things about the text in comparison to its Indian models is that it devotes a whole section to female medical problems. Janet brings this out very clearly. Is this good or is this bad? Well, it depends on how the particular ailments are handled and that, of course, is complex, as is the treatment of the category of the third sex, neither male nor female. The third sex is known in Tibetan as maning. This was sometimes referred to in this literature as the bodhisattva. How interesting. Janet speculates a bit this about this, but isn't able to explain it. Hmm, very interesting. <laughs> Very interesting matter. I won't try to summarize what was said except to say that I came away from this chapter, perhaps as much as from any other chapter in this extremely rich book, feeling that I had been challenged to think about gender in much more sophisticated ways than I had ever been before. And then my fourth point about conventional truth, and here I stray back to my Madhyamaka roots. Finally, this is my last point, I'd like to make a few comments about something that had particular resonance for my own research on Indian Madhyamaka. You know, of course, that Madhyamakas are concerned about two truths. Most of the discussion, at least in the beginning of this tradition has to do with the ultimate truth that everything is empty of identity or of own being as it's sometimes called. But what about conventional truth in Madhyamaka? In what way do things exist conventionally even when they are empty ultimately? In 8th century Madhyamaka a group of thinkers developed a three-part definition of conventional truth. They say Correct conventional truth arises dependently. It's capable of effective action. That means it's in some way perhaps empirically verifiable. And it satisfies without analysis. I've spent some time thinking about ways in which the third criterion can serve as the basis for moral action about how we sometimes make moral choices without being able to analyze fully their implications, to use the Nike appropriation of a phrase that was made pop popular in Zen, we just do it. We just do it. Chapter one on the medical paintings that the Desi commissioned to illustrate his magnum op opus gave me a new way of thinking about no analysis. Professor Gyatso points out a painting that tells people to do a particular sadhana, that's a meditative practice, without specifying any particular sadhana. She also mentions a painting where a monk is reading a text that's just covered with squiggles as if to say that he's reading, uh, in Janet's words, that Dharma stuff, without specifying which Dharma stuff it is. 
Mark knows this is one of the nicest passages in the book. Then she says that religion in this context has been decentered and recontextualized in the medical paintings. It has been made into a whatever. What a nice way to picture satisfaction without analysis. Now to acknowledge this extremely important conceptual breakthrough in Professor Gatso's book, I'd like to present you Professor Gatso with the t-shirt that we produced <laughs> in Religion 74 in your absence this fall and make you an honorary member of the Harvard whatever association. <laughs> so here we go. Do you have one of these? <laughs> We know what this, this is an important phrase from uh, Dharmakirti, uh, in Dharmakirti's Pramanavartika, he allows the Madhyamaka objector to speak once in the whole text. He's just defined ultimate truth as one thing and conventional truth as the other. And the Madhyamaka says what you call ultimate is what we call conventional. And this is Dharmakirti's response. Astu yatatata, make sure you get your iPhones out and take a picture of this, because this is the translation. <laughs> so, Professor Gatso, I ceremonially present this to you in thanks for your marvelous book. <laughs> thanks to all of you for your patient attention, and thanks again to Professor Gatso. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. I think that's the first time one of our respondents has actually given a gift to the speaker. <laughs> we would have expected like a scarf or something like that, but no, 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 this is no moving scarf. things forward. If in fact we, if we decide next year to, to rethink and have a Christmas party, we'll definitely invite you back to, <laughs> and, and we'll be uh, from photographing that as well. So thank you very much. It was wonderful. Our second respondent tonight needs no introduction also. Mark Jordan is the Andrew Mellon Professor of Christian Thought here at the university. He's a wide-ranging scholar of Christian theology, European philosophy, and gender studies, and teaches accordingly a wide range of courses in the Western traditions of Christian theology the Prospects for Sexual Ethics and the Relations of Religion to Art and Literature. Uh, he continues his groundbreaking work on Thomas Aquinas. Uh, a few years back, he had a book called Rewritten Theology, Aquinas After His Readers. And his next book, that will be out any day now, and we'll have a book session next year, surely, is entitled Teaching Bodies, Traditions of Moral Formation in Thomas Aquinas. So stay tuned. Uh, he's also written extensively in the field of sexual ethics, producing books that are widely regarded to have opened important new conversations, particularly regarding homosexuality and ethical reflection on marriage. And a whole series of publications in this field could be mentioned, just to mention a couple, four. Uh, the Ethics of Sex, 2001, Telling Truths in Church, 2002, Blessing Same-Sex Unions, 2005, and Recruiting Young Love, How Christians Talk About Homosexuality, 2011. And regarding the larger conversations of philosophy, religion, and American Western culture, his most recent book, Convulsing Bodies, Religion and Resistance in Foucault, was discussed in this room not so long ago. So although, as far as I know, Mark is not a Tibetan scholar, and uh, at least doesn't show it to us, I can't think of a more humane and well-versed universal scholar than Mark Jordan to also give a response tonight, so welcome. I want a t-shirt too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. In public, you want me to say? <laughs> my, my, Thanks to Frank and Lexi and Matthew and other colleagues here at the center for hosting another of these delightful conversations. They are delightful. And my thanks to Janet for including me on the panel despite my ignorance, but much more for writing this fascinating and sumptuous book. It gives us much to talk about and much to look at. 
Given my all too obvious limits as a reader, I wanted to concentrate on two questions that kept rising for me throughout the book. They may only be symptoms of my ignorance, but as we know, even ignorance can be instructive. So I offer these questions to Janet. The first has to do with realism, um, especially but not only in medical representation. The second question has to do with the separateness or even autonomy of medical discourses within a culture shaped by religious discourses, especially religious discourses of an ascetical and idealizing type, another of Janet's words. Let me begin, as she so delightfully does, with the question of representation. Janet opens the book, as you've heard, with that remarkable set of medical paintings. One of her points about it is that it shows a growing tendency towards realism, a tendency that she traces into a number of other cultural attitudes. So realism comes eventually to be associated with preferences for direct observation over scholastic authority, for frank criticism over pious commentary, for an emphasis on the local and historical rather than the legendary and timeless. But let me focus on the realism of the drawings themselves. I take it that realism as applied to these medical drawings can mean at least three things. First, it can mean that the drawings look more real to us, that they conform to our standards of realist representation. Because, of course, pictorial realism is a convention that varies not only across artistic traditions, but within them. In short, realism is also local and historical. This is Ernst Gombrich's familiar argument in Art and Illusion. Realist art is not a direct imitation of reality, and progress in realism is not just making better copies of what everyone sees. Realism is an effect produced within certain conventions that are contested, revised, replaced. Gombrich recalls the story about John Constable's efforts to replace the varnished, mellow browns used to depict grass by realist painters in England around 1830. Constable prided himself on copying landscape colors from life. Indeed, he had plant and tree cuttings brought into his studio just as they were brought in to Janet's painters. Yet the jurors at the Royal Academy judged at least one of Constable's efforts that nasty green thing. Both the jurors and constable were accomplished realist painters, but they had quite different notions about how to paint grass realistically. Gombrich goes further. If you could carry constable's water meadows near Salisbury out from the Victoria and Albert Museum to put it on a lawn, constable's green would not look like the green of grass at least not that grass in Knightsbridge on a bright July afternoon. So to talk of progressive realism in representation requires further specification of the conventions of realism being marked. Second, realism in representation can have a second meaning. It can be contrasted with the ideal. This often has more to do with the topics or contents of the image than with the conventions of its representation. So for example, we might contrast an epic, idealizing canvas like Leutz's Washington crossing the Delaware with the etchings in Goya's Disasters of War. Leutz's painting uses a range of sophisticated techniques to render visual elements including light and color, while Goya's images are more like cartoons. Still, we might say that Goya is more realistic because we judge that he represents war as it actually is, not as, it's not as it is imagined in a mythology of national founding. 
This is not a remark on technique or representational convention so much as a remark on topic. So, too, in the paintings Janet represents, we might be struck with the growing interest in depicting ordinary people or ordinary activities, people raising children, people having sex. We might be struck especially by the inclusion of incidents of daily domestic life, even when, or precisely when, they have no direct relevance to the medical texts being illustrated. But here we encounter, as Janet keeps reminding us, a different problem of representation, which is the relation of the typical to the individual or the type to the instance. So some of Janet's images are much closer to diagrams than to portraits. Sometimes they are meant to show the typical disposition of bodily parts or the identifying marks of medicinal plants. But at other times, they seem more like names or concepts arranged visually for ease of understanding or memorization. Even in the case of plant drawings, there is always a considerable distance between image and the individual plant you have in front of you. I say this as an old gardener. So you, we might also notice that realistic content in the sense of daily life or ordinary bodies can go along with the abstraction of the type, the schematic diagram. You don't want a diagram to be too realistic. That would only make it confusing. There is finally a third meaning of realism in scientific and medical illustration. This is the real as the really intelligible the real as the field of intelligibility within which objects are truly known. We might think of realism in this sense as the assumed space traversed by the gaze of the illustrator or the physician. I can make this a bit clearer by another analogy and by invoking Michel Foucault, whom Janet also sometimes invokes though for other purposes. That's my excuse. I would probably invoke Foucault anyway. So, yeah. At the start of his book on modern changes in European medicine, Birth of the Clinic, Foucault juxtaposes two medical descriptions separated by less than 100 years. The first, from the middle of the 18th century, describes the results of a regimen of baths prescribed for dryness of the nerves. The patient's body, observed only from the outside, begins to reject pieces of itself. The medical regimen is actually a regime of torture for the poor woman undergoing it. The second description from the first quarter of the 19th century depicts a lesion in an anatomatized brain. Foucault asks, how do these two medical descriptions differ? He answers, not by quantity of imagination, however much we've been taught to believe that the earlier text about the medical treatment is driven by fantasy and the later text is a sober report of unimpeded observation. We were taught, in other words, that truly modern medicine liberated the space of seeing from the fantastical figures that once obscured our view on reality. For Foucault, that story of progress in medical description is itself an obscuring fantasy. There is a change in view from one of the juxtaposed medical texts to another, but it doesn't result from an increase in realism. The change comes in how the later medicine conceives intelligible space, where it places illnesses to suffuse them with analytic clarity. Medical language has also changed between Foucault's two selections. It has taken up what seems a new style, meticulous, measured, minutely attentive, fastidious in its deployment of adjectives. So despite what its myth of origin asserts, modern European medicine isn't a new commitment to seeing things clearly. It is a change in the domain of what is to be seen 
and understood. No longer bodies, but parts of bodies represented to anatomical analysis. If that suggestion is right, then it raises an interesting question for Janet's drawings. What new space of knowledge do they imply? Or what do they ask us to suppose in the very practice of representation about what there is to know in human bodies? If they are more real, what reality do they judge most visible, most knowable, most treatable? This third sense of realism, medical realism, as a claim about the objects of knowledge leads me to the other question I wanted to lay before Janet. This is a question about the relation of medical discourses to the larger discourses of Buddhist culture, what she sometimes calls the space apart for medicine. Here again, I fear that my ignorance requires me to proceed by making clumsy analogies between Tibetan medical traditions and those other contacts between religious culture and Galen that happened a bit to the West, I mean in Western Europe. One of the most striking things for me in reading Janet's book was the recognition that Tibetan physicians and Western European physicians were both dealing with some of the same medical root texts, the works of that Hellenistic physician philosopher, Galen. As Janet analyzes the changes in medical tradition in Tibet, she occasionally proposes comparisons with European developments. For example, she raises the question of multiple modernities, the sense in which Tibet or India might be undergoing modernization entirely apart from European contacts or colonization. Given the status of Tibetan medicine, how far Tibetan medicine had come, and especially the reliance on human dissection, it makes sense to compare 16th or 17th century Tibetan medicine with European medicine in and after the 16th century. That is, the time of Azalius's extraordinary drawings of human dissections. So I understand why you compare Tibetan medicine in the 17th century with European medicine in the 16th. But I was also struck by interesting analogies between the Tibetan developments and the situation of European medicine in the 13th or 14th centuries. That is, at the moment when European religious institutions had to make sense of the rapid influx of a whole library of new medical texts. So in these years, a number of Christian theologians began to worry that medicine represented not so much a necessary skill as an alternate way of thinking about the world, a way of thinking not entirely compatible with their religion. The story of Galen in the European Middle Ages is complicated, so let me only tell the very small piece of it I need to draw the analogy and to articulate the question. In the early Middle Ages, some fragments of the ancient medical bibliography survived the cultural disruptions, but these were mainly Roman texts or Latin translations of Hippocrates. Beginning in the late 11th century, there is a new infusion of Galenic texts from the Arabic. They were also accompanied by Arabic commentary. So for example, Galen's Art of Medicine appears in Latin with an introduction called the Isagoge of Ioannitius, which is actually an abridged Arabic work disguised as a Greek work. At this time, the working library of medical texts in Western Europe is still very small. Indeed, 12th century Latin readers assemble a short canon of medical texts called the Articella, which includes Ioannitius, sometimes Galen, two works by Hippocrates, and two short works on diagnosis by pulse and by urine. This canon begins to attract a number of commentators working in different genres, including rendering the Articella into charts for easy memory. I kept thinking of the Articella when I was reading in Janet about the four treatises. 
because the commentary practices and the mnemonic devices are exactly the same. Even though there was no effort to pass this collection off as a work by a Christian authority, it did not seem to pose problems for Christian readers. Indeed, some of its most technical doctrines passed quickly into monastic writing. So, for example, models of cerebral anatomy from the Articella enter into Cistercian treatises on the human body and soul. Here I kept thinking of the question of the tantric channels. Um, by the 13th century, though, adaptation is no longer so easy. Much more Galenic medicine has been translated from the Arabic, and new translations of Galen are also beginning to be made from the Greek. The increase in the number of texts gave a much better picture of Galen and a more unsettling one. Christian theologians also learned that Islamic writers on philosophy and theology had engaged in running critique of what they regarded as the dangerous implications of Galenic medicine and medicine in general. Let me take a single example. Around 1270, the Dominican Ramon Marti published a comprehensive work called the Pugio Fidei, the Dagger of Faith. Not a peaceful man, our Ramon. Indeed, he had been engaged for decades in the Dominican combat with Judaism and Islam. In the Pugio Fidei, Ramon divides the teachers of error into three kinds. There are the teachers of the temporal or carnal pleasures, there are the naturalists or physicians, and there are the philosophers. Galen is declared the prince of the second group for his brazen denial of an immortal human soul. Probably, Ramon Marti is getting this accusation directly from an Arabic source, from Ghazali. Whatever its source, we can find critiques of Galen in a growing number in other Christian texts, for example, in encyclopedias or in commentaries on Aristotle. Because not only did Galen dissent from Christian doctrine, he also disagreed with Aristotle, who was rapidly becoming the authorized technical language for Christian universities. Some 13th century authors move beyond rehearsing disagreements of Aristotle and Galen to mount an Aristotelian ta attack on the bases of all medical knowledge. Roger Bacon, for example, writes a treatise on the errors of the physicians, in which he not only exposes the ignorance of quacks, but also accuses even the best physicians, including Galen, of not having a properly philosophical foundation. The story of Galen continues let me stop the history recital there in order to frame the question which the comparison suggests to me. I keep trying to picture the separateness of medicine within Tibetan Buddhist culture, especially its relation to what Janet calls Buddhist regimes of personal cultivation. How would we draw this relationship of medicine in its multiple aspects? Is it a hierarchy or separate planes of reality or distinct social spheres or just the familiar capacity of distracted human beings to think two very different things at once, especially when they're in pain? Or how do you draw an epistemic wedge, to use another one of Janet's examples? And in whose intelligible space do we perform the drawing? Is the drawing of the difference or the relation between medicine and the rest drawn in medical space? Most of all, I wonder whether the heroes of Janet's medical realism might have been harboring grander schemes for intellectual reform or harboring deeper doubts. I wonder, in other words, whether their conservative opponents were right to be worried that medicine might always be drawn on top. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So before opening it for discussion, we give Janet a chance to take up points raised by her discussant. So Janet.
Well, thank you both for uh, some really interesting uh, comments and challenging questions, which I was trying to take in. First of all, what the questions are, let alone think of the answer. So let me just take a stab at a few of them. Let me start with Mark first, because it's in my mind. What are those questions? Um, the realism question. Um, uh, so I guess you, we're talking primarily about these paintings. One of the interesting things about the paintings, and I should tell the audience really what they are. So the, the um, Four Treatises is uh, it's, it's just really one book uh, with four main sections. It has something like um, over 200 chapters. Uh, and each of the chapters is on a particular branch of medicine or a particular issue. And so some, so in the uh, 17th, late 17th century, this uh, commentator, who is also a very important person in the Tibetan government with the fifth Dalai Lama, decided to put together a team of artists to actually illustrate all of the knowledge in that whole text. I think primarily his idea was to illustrate the anatomy so there's maybe 15 or more very detailed illustrations of, of, the, of the bones, the, the skeleton, the nervous system, the cardiovascular system, muscles, uh, certain other distinct you know, categories of the physiology and in the anatomy in particular. And these are very, very detailed with lots of little um, uh, captions which uh, point out, you know, here's this muscle over here and here's that mus muscle over there. And these paintings are used in the classroom to actually teach students about the human body. Secondly, it illustrates with many, many plates uh, all of the materia medica, so especially all the medical botany. So lots and lots of plants. And here the idea is, is that the um, a physician stares at these paintings in preparation for going out in the field. One of the big parts of a medical education in Tibetan medicine was actually going out in the field and be able to recognize uh, med medicinal plants that are growing and to collect them and bring them back and make your own medicine. That's what physicians had to do. And these, illustra these illustrations, now what type of realism they're engaged in, that's a question. But they're, re they're meant to be such that when you um, look at them and then you see something in the field, it's going to be a guide to saying, hmm, hmm, it's got four leaves with a point over there, and hmm, that's, that's that. And so therefore, I can say that's probably this plant and pick it up. However, they didn't stop at that. They also then go on to illustrate everything in, in the text, which includes um, all sorts of other uh, uh, suggestions about types of remedies, which includes lifestyle issues. For example, one you know, delightful uh, example is um, you know, how the practice of having sex um, affects your health. Uh, when to have sex, when not to have sex, when, it, when it's bad for a certain health condition, and so on and so forth. Or uh, how, to, how to cook certain kinds of broths that have a medicinal value, and so on. And in this case, the art, there, the, the, the illustrations are not really telling the physician anything. The, 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 the visual information doesn't give them any more information than the actual text does itself. I think rather what happened is that they're already making these paintings, and they take the opportunity to illustrate a whole bunch of other things also. And that's where the, the medical illustrations become so much fun. Because indeed, you see all kinds of uh, illustrations of, of uh, couples in bed together, always with the blankets over them and stuff. But they're but they're wearing different hats while they're doing it, or they have different color, um, you know, skins or all sorts of other things. Uh, or um, they're showing people cooking the broth, and while they're cooking the broth, they're they're actually having a conversation with someone else, and they're like, and or they're they're having fun at the same time. So there, it's not an issue about realism at all. The real issue, what I was trying to point attention to, was the everyday. The fact that, that, that aspects of everyday life were being illustrated, which 
in many, many cases, we have no other example of such activities being illustrated in, in all of the very, very voluminous amount of Tibetan painting that we have. It's all you know, illustrated icons. And so this was the first time that the everyday could be illustrated. So to what degree are these realistic? Um, I mean, of the three types that you mentioned, so that's what I really have to think, and I'm going to have to ask you to give me a copy of your comments. Um, all three of them, they certainly are meant to be real, well, not so much the first one that they look real to us. There are no existing standards of what looks real or not. I don't, it's not in the vocabulary. It's not an, a question that's out there. What, you know, a visual image, an icon, is meant to inspire certain emotions. It's not a question of what looks real or not. However, there is meant to be a correspondence between what's on this, on the, on the page and what's there in the world. So when you look at an arm, when you look at the painting and you say, okay, this is the place where you should do mock combustion, you, you look at the painting and you see it's halfway between and then you, and under, under this kind of ridge and it helps you when you look at a, an actual person's arm. You know, you, you have more information than if you just were reading a, a verbal description. So in that sense, it's meant to be realistic. The Tibetans were very much aware of the problem of uh, what you mentioned, this notion of the ideal and, the, and any particular individual token, that what they're trying to represent is a, a, a typical arm or a typical plant. So it, in fact, the, the technical term is used is it's an example. So this is an example of this type of plant. And you know, which example do you choose? Do you, you don't choose like the ones in my garden which are practically all dead and therefore they don't even have the fruits that are supposed to. You, you, you choose a flourishing one that shows all the typical features. But they're very much aware of the fact that any particular example in the world is not going to adhere and it's not gonna look exactly like this image. Nonetheless, it is very helpful to have this uh, much better than just, again, simply the verbal description. Um, I guess real as intelligible to the degree that I understood it is, um, is, is probably most accurate. I have to go back and read Foucault on this to think more about it, and I do t intend to you know, write more about some of the theoretical implications of this. Let, let me just also, also say, just in terms of comparison with European medicine and so on, that's such a, you know, a huge, huge area that I really decided early on that it was quite enough to kind of just unpack what, these, what was going on in these texts on their own terms. Uh, but there's so much to be said, and, and I think so much to be learned by precisely these really val valuable comparisons. But I do think that to what I, from what I understood of what you said, it was, and it kind of relates to the second question about the space of heart. That part of what I see the physicians doing is trying to clear away other traditions, other, other knowledge, other expectations in order to have a place for, in a very practical way of what the physician needs, so to speak. I don't know if that, is really what Foucault has in mind. But um, it certainly is, is um, it's, it's not so much taking up an issue of the fantastical or not, that this is not fantastical, this is more real. It's rather, um, hmm, uh, what, I'm read, reading your question, what new space of knowledge, what do they act, what do they ask us to suppose? I, you know, again, it gets back to the question of the ideal type. I think one of the things that they ask the viewer to suppose is that everything is imperfect, everything is fading, everything is not the ideal type. Uh, one of the really interesting things in the illustrations, by the way, were uh, cases where they're showing some of the organs of the body, as an example, or in many of the anatomical, uh, illustrations 
where you know you have like a, a male naked figure basically who's I should have brought you slides and shown you but anyway I thought that wasn't the appropriate thing to do here but um, uh, they uh, so it shows the, the sort of upper part of the torso and but then you can see inside you see the liver and the lungs and, and the heart and the person is just sort of standing there like you know this so you can look in so on the, in, in one and the same stroke, this image on the one hand is showing, okay, that's a typical heart, that's a typical lung, that's a typical um, liver, and that's where they are with respect to each other in the body. And yet, each of these illustrations, one after another, the, the actual figures, the guys, they're all men, by the way, that was another thing, but um, they, they're all totally different. One guy has this really wild, frizzy hair, the next guy has a huge handlebar mu mustache. The next guy is totally bald. You know, and, and that, again, it had nothing to do with what the medical tech is about, but you, but you saw in one of the same stroke, they're trying to hit both buttons at the same time. They're both trying to give you this sort of typical common human predicament that everybody has these organs, and yet saying that actually each and every individual token is completely different. And it's trying to respect that individuality and the commonality at, at the same time. And there's something about that which is very different than the Madhyamaka notion of the conventional Buddhist truth, which I'll get to in a second. What is the, just secondly, Mark's question about the space apart. Um, fascinating history, you know, I was just listening to that, and again, you, you'll hand that over to me now. But, uh, <laughs> um, <coughs> um, but what did I write down? Um, oh, so what is that space? What was, what was your question again? Uh, where does that space occur? Uh, it, it basically occurs, first of all, there's kind of subterfuge. They, they really have to work to get that space. So what they're trying to do is get the, everybody happy. You know, okay, we've we found a way to make this the, the teachings of the Buddha after all, even though we know that it was, these are not the teachings of, of the Buddha. We found a way to make it somehow work with the yogic idea of the body, which we know empirically is not the case at all. But, you know, in the text, they, they kind of cover their butts in a, a, a hundred different ways. And then finally, they get everybody to shut up and go home and then they give you a detailed account of this is the, the thigh bone is connected to the, this bone and that bone is connected to that bone, detail by detail. Physically, where is that space occurring? It's in the monasteries, in, on the monastery grounds. There it will be a separate building, I suppose, or a separate room where these works are studied and then where the practices, you know, where, where the physicians are pra practicing. Uh, but you go inside the room where the doctor is and he starts taking your pulse and you're sitting with him, um, there's a different discourse. There's a, just a different, um, it's like a different uni universe in terms of what's important, what's really um, being referred to, what can you rely on, what are your hopes, what are your expectations, it's completely different than in the Buddhist world. So I don't know if that begins to answer some of the questions. Um, so then uh, back to David. First of all, thank you so much for that t-shirt. Um, <laughs> and I, I believe me, first of all, it's nice and big, which I like, but uh, <laughs> the fact that it says whatever, and also in Sanskrit it says, uh, may it, may it, what, whatever it is, you know, yet to that extent, such as it is, or some kind of expression like that. Um, growing up in Philadelphia, whatever is surely one of my favorite expressions. In fact, when I first started reading these medical works, when, when I saw that I could use that word what, whatever and use it in some sort of technical sense, I said, okay, that's why I'm going to do this project, actually, so I can... So I, I should have actually titled the book, what, Whatever. <laughs> um, so thank you. That's unbelievable that you, that you, that you did that for me with, with your class. <coughs> No, I, I know that it wasn't actually for me. <laughs> um, but uh, I just wanted to say, oh, yeah, the thing about bringing the people to life, I'll just say two things, one of which uh, had a lot to do with the fact that I was reading these works with my Tibetan co colleague. And he was the one who was, you know, normally when you read Tibetan works, first of all, you're just trying to figure out what the thing says, you know, and getting through the grammar and so on. 
um, let alone the irony and all the kind of subtle jokes that are there. Uh, but he was, you know, he was reading and chuckling. He said, oh my God, I can't believe he just said that. He is, he, this guy is really a badass dude. I mean, the fact that he like, you know, and, and so watching, so that was one of the great pleasures of doing the project was watching his face while I'm reading the text with him. In fact, I'll just say in my entire career, everything I've done, I've done all, all of my work has been reading closely my sources with various Tibetan colleagues, and that's been the greatest pleasure of all. That's the, what I learned the most from is watching, not looking at the text myself, but watching how they're reading the text. So for, for him, and he's in a kind of live tradition where these works and some of the debates that are going on are still live debates inside Tibet today. By the way, let me just tell you, um, I went to a conference when I first started working on this project in 2000. There was a big conference on Tibetan medicine in Lhasa which all of us thought was kind of a big propaganda machine. It was just going to be a bunch of garbage. A few weeks before the conference happened, I suddenly woke up in the middle of the night and I said, what are you, crazy? You're not going to this thing? I mean, there's like a huge conference on medicine in Tibet. You know, get your butt there, go. So I bought a ticket and went, and it was an amazing conference of you know, medical experts from all over the country. Um, and in these small group in rooms, you know, screaming and debating out these very issues that are coming up in the sect. Did is this work really the teaching of the Buddha? How do we know? How can we tell what the authorship was? All these other issues. So these are live issues. And so when you're reading it with someone who's in that situation where these things really mean something, uh, th that helped me to bring it to life. And it was one of the great pleasures. I'll also say that. A certain unnamed reader for the press, who I know and you know, um, was very critical of some of my language, um, and he thought I was being too informal and too. I, I was picking up some of the sarcasm in the works themselves, and which I do, which is still there. But I took out a lot of it because he was he he thought it was like way over the top, and maybe that was a mistake. I, I don't know, but um, so I, I toned it down. It, it was far it was far far more alive, I think, in the first draft. Um, let me just say, because um, I've talked long enough, I, I won't really say anything about the conventional truth, except that I think that the con this is not about Buddhist conventional truth. I think it's a different thing. I'll just say that. The one I do, th I just do want to share with the audience the interesting thing about the Bodhisattva and this whole gender issue. So for those of you who don't know, the Bodhisattva is the sort of quintessential enlightened figure in, in Mahayana Buddhist tradition of this sort of enlightened person who's, who does everything selflessly for others and is completely you know, available to help others. That's the purpose of being alive, OK? So in the uh, Pulse tradition, so one of the in interesting things about um, Tibetan Pulse is that it's very similar to East Asian Pulse systems, except for the fact that uh, the basic classification of types of Pulse in Tibetan medicine, you know, there's many types of classifications, but the most basic one is into three categories, male, female, and third sex. So first of all, in Chinese medicine, they don't really classify pulse as even male or female. Uh, in Chinese medicine, the third sex is not an important, it's not really mentioned. Actually, third sex ideas it comes from India and I think also in Tibet as well, so you, it's not coming out of China. But, uh, but otherwise, it takes a lot from the Chinese system. So what do they mean by male pulse, female pulse? and third sex pulse. This is actually really just the classification system. One of the interesting things that they say right away um, is that it's not the case that all men have male pulses and all females have female pulses. Male pulse, female pulse, and third sex pulse are just three kinds of pulse that any gendered sexed person can have. Um, and so, um, so female pulse is a soft, as you can imagine, it does participate <laughs> these gender stereotypes. It's soft, gentle pulse, right? What's the male pulse like? Gentle. Rough, tough, you know, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then the, the, and the third sex pulse is somewhere in between. Okay, so, uh, and they use this funny word manning, which is a really interesting word, which we have no idea what the etymology is and where the, <laughs> <coughs> where this comes from. However, 
um, so just a weird word. But uh, in a couple of texts, they also gloss it. Another term they use instead of the word maning is bodhisattva pulse. Now, however, maning, this, this, the, the notion of the third sex, in Buddhist monasticism, if you're a third sexer, and what does it mean to be a third sexer? A third sex person, it's, it's, it's apparently not about your sexual practice or anything like that, it's about your anatomy. If your anatomy is somewhere ambiguous between what's seen to be the stereotypical male and the stereotypical female, it's for any reason ambiguous in between, you're the third sex person, you're not allowed to take ordination. So there, unfortunately, there's a whole chapter in Buddhist thought which is very much you know, concerned with you know, normality and abnormality in sexual anatomy, which is very different than me medicine. Um, and, and then the, the Buddhist texts actually go after this third sex person who not only can't take ordination, but can't even listen to the Dharma, uh, is not capable of getting enlightened, is not capable of meditating. Now, but the, the funny thing is that, you know, why is this person not capable of meditating is because um, it has something to do with the person's too even keeled, actually. So he's not one thing or the other. You know, if, if, if you're strongly a female or you're strongly a male, it's clear what you are, and then you meditate to kind of bring that under control, and then you have a kind of dynamic or a sort of tension. And something about the third sex person who's so flexible and slippery and can go in and out doesn't have that tension to work with, apparently. But nonetheless, the Buddhist texts are very negative on this person as having something wrong with him. So I said, why do they call then this, why do they juxtapose the third sex term with bodhisattva? I asked this to people, all my Tibetan friends. Nobody wanted to talk about it. They, they all said, oh, that's just, nah, it doesn't mean anything. It's just like, whatever. They just, you know, they just, they just decided to call it bodhisattva. Was, Come on. They didn't, you know, that's like a highly, you know, charged term. Bodhisattva pulse? Bodhisattva is the third sex person? Wow, whoa, you know, very interesting. Nobody would admit this was important, not a single person. Um, but I think it's the, the reasons are obvious. For, the, for medicine, actually, the, the, the sort of type, this typology of being in between, of being flexible, being in balance, is a picture of health. And that's, and that's well typified by a person who's in between these two extremes. So it's a really interesting case, again, where, you know, different values and different aims come to the fore, and, and sometimes the language, you know, crashes into each other, and they go, oops, didn't notice that. Oh, yeah, we, yeah, we use the word bodhisattva. I don't know, you know. So anyway, all right, that's enough. Um, but thank you again for all your, your comments. I appreciate it very much. question about your process. Um, I'm curious about how you went about thinking about similarity and difference between these two different things, Buddhism and medicine. For example, I imagine that we could think about practices. Are bodily exercises similar to different literary conventions, evocation of authority, spaces, circulation, who's writing these things, lineages? I can imagine there are all different ways that we could compare them. In fact, I think I heard you say discourse was one of the main differences. I imagine that if we looked at all these things, it's not going to be entirely similar or entirely different. But in some ways, you selected certain areas that you thought were more important to determine whether they were similar or different, like discourse. And I'm curious which ones you selected and why you thought those would have been more important than the alternatives where we might have seen similarity. Well, that's because I'm a... I'm not coming into this assuming that there's these two things called Buddhism and medicine, and then looking for similarities and differences. Um, I, I'm starting in the thick of the text itself and seeing what's coming, what's speaking to me, what's the emphasis. And I guess what helped in terms of my methodology, a lot of what my methodology was was informed by my own background in Buddhist studies. So what I've come to expect in reading texts and, and being shocked that it wasn't there. And, and not that I was looking for it. I'm, I'm sort of reading the text and saying, wait a minute, 
where's that other stuff? Where, when's that going to kick in? When are they going to talk about the Buddha's dispensation thing and blah, 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 and not seeing it? And then saying, oh, and, and so these things are kind of emerging in front of me. And I mean, that's how I'm focusing on what's, you know, what I, what, what I was really trying to bring out if that helps you. So I guess the material itself spoke to me, but I'm not assuming that they're, these are two different domains. This is precisely the point, is that these are very much overlapping domains. And, 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 but what I'm trying to say is just because they're overlapping doesn't mean that it erases, that there's not interesting differences to identify. And it's really important not to go to that route and say, oh, no, 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 you know, making the, you know, science and religion two different things is like a Western in, in a position. <coughs> I think that's, that's a mistake also. So that's, that's where it's coming from. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I really enjoyed the book. Thank you for writing it. Um, one question that struck me was, um, I, I believe you make the claim that these medical texts, they're not necessarily, or we shouldn't necessarily think of them as Buddhist texts, but rather that they're operating within a Buddhist world. Yeah. So this question of um, if they're Buddhist, if they're not, is that something that you think that these Tibetan intellectuals were actually concerned with themselves? Is that getting at the tension that they're dealing with? Or is that our own hang-ups and kind of categories that we're sort of stuck on? Is it Buddhist or is it not? Um, I want to use an important phrase which I have to attribute to Professor Hallisey, which is intercultural mimesis. That, it, that uh, as scholars and the field of Buddhist studies, is not is in some ways picking up on dichotomies and ideas and intentions which are coming in at a Buddhist context as well, and there's a kind of back and forth um, between them. Um, I do think that the issues that I'm that I'm that this I, I do think that there is a explicit discomfort and tension about the identification of this material as Buddhist. And what does it mean to be Buddhist? I mean, one of the ways that they try to make it Buddhist is just slap on at the beginning, thus did the Buddha speak at one time, mm -hmm. which is the way that all Buddhist scriptures begin. So that just ends the question. It's taught by the Buddha, so how is that not Buddhist? Um, but that didn't exactly work. It, it, it both worked and didn't work. It kind of, as I said before, it sort of shut everybody up, and so everything's fine. This was taught by the Buddha. It's one of the reasons why it didn't get into as much trouble as it did in Europe. And yet, at the same time, everybody knew, or a lot of people knew, that there was a kind of discomfort because it was clearly, this is drawing on, basically, the Tibetan medical text draws a lot on the Ayurvedic tradition in, in India, which is not, quintessentially a Buddhist tradition, has its own sort of legacy. And Galenic medicine, which is coming through Arabic sources into Tibet as well, and Chinese medicine, which is coming from the East, all those things, and plus all kinds of indigenous m medical traditions which are in Asia. So, um, no, it, you know, we could talk about it a afterwards, but I, I thought that I tried to show places where they themselves are aware of, you know, is this really Buddhist or not? And they're using terms that they invent to get at that problem. Mm -hmm. Time for one more question. <coughs> yes, thank you very much for this. I really want to buy a beautiful book today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, have, I have typical three questions. So the f they are, they're actually, they're actually <laughs> correlated. <laughs> the okay. first question- You have one second to <laughs> there, The first question is we know that uh, the Medicine and religion from East, actually they are correlated. So each medicine system actually linked to a philosophy of the religion. But uh, I want to ask you, what is actually the philosophy behind the West medicine? That is the first question. Maybe your colleague can also answer these questions from the uh, European uh, medicine uh, uh, area. And the second is we know that um, in Western medicine area right now, the biggest challenge is 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 the gender, because since the beginning, all the tests and examinations uh, not uh, not done based on gender. So right now we find out that the 
the, the big side effect of, uh, actually happened on female. Um, that is, uh, that is a contra contradictory to the Eastern medicine uh, system, but also it's very difficult to Western medicine right now to change. So this is a fundamental methodology fraud that al already the Western medicine, medicine acknowledged. So I want to ask you, how can you uh, convince your colleagues from the medical school to, you know, to believe this? East medicine, Tibet medicine, methodology, philosophy, easy. Uh, I, I hate to so say that I... You have time, but I think it was another question. Right? Well, I just didn't exactly understand. First of all, were there three questions or two questions? Actually, three questions, but I combined to the two. <laughs> <laughs> so the okay. first one well, the is one about the philosophy. I'm not sure that, you know, 100% that it's, that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence that every single <coughs> medical system, you know, links to some religious system, I think, that the philosophy system. Yeah, or philosophy system. I'm not sure that's so easily so. And we would have to s talk a lot about that. I'm not exactly sure that that's true. Uh, certainly in terms of modern medicine, it's not so easy to say exactly what philosophical system it links to or not. And I, I don't think it would, would be this one system. <laughs> okay, here's this <laughs> tradition of medicine, and it relates to this particular philosophical system. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think that stands. Uh, you know, we know, for example, in Indian Ayurvedic um, writings, it, um, it, you know, so for example, the notion of the three humors in Indian medicine connects very much to Sankhya philosophy, that's true. Um, but that's not everything that you can say about Ayurveda, so it's not sh true that the entire quote-unquote system, even if it is one single <coughs> coherent system, medicine itself, then can be connected to any given so-called coherent philosophical system. So I think that that's a, that's a very, very complicated question. You're making assumptions I don't, I'm not sure that can stand. And then uh, sec what was the other question about gender? Yeah. And gender. so what was the question in that? So there is no gender uh, uh, category in the uh, Western medicine system, but it is. What do you mean there's no gender category in the Western? Because medicine? when you did the Western in the Western medicine, you actually tested based on the age. So there is only two category. One is children and adults. So all the medicine actually develops based on the age, not based on the gender. Drugs and, and treatment. Is that what you're talking about? No, the actually every medicine, the dose to put and uh, uh, is actually based on the tested uh, based on male, not female, because the female's hormone yes, is that's complicated. True. Yes, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Right. So this uh, this is that a fundamental a problem, problem of the methodological right. problem. Yeah. So how can you? Uh, I mean that how can you convince your colleagues from medical school? To believe. Based on Tibetan medicine? Yeah. It's, no, I think you're just going to have to go with it, you know, sort of the, the, the obvious empirical problems of, you know, of the side effects that you're talking about in different hormones. It's like bringing my book to them is not going to be the thing that, that convinces them. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. And unfortunately, we should bring our formal session to a conclusion by thanking Jeff Gaston.